I started out focusing really on youth, uh, but throughout some of this, there is adults, and so I kind of did go youth and adults um, with disabilities and kind of taking it a, maybe a little bit bigger picture uh, with it. So some just informative pieces. So looking at what is the current status of physical activity for individuals with disabilities? Uh, what are some barriers and, and facilitators that the research shows us uh, exist for individuals with disabilities? And then I'll give you a very, very brief um, information on a study that, that I conducted um, looking at factors that influence staff inclusion. And then some ideas on what can be done within the community to help uh, increase inclusion, and then some really, actually really great resources that are out there uh, at multiple levels, at the community level, at the organization level, and for individuals. So that's what we got. Is there any questions? Okay. So US statistics for those reporting uh, disabilities. Across the nation right now, we've got about 19% that are reporting um, for youth that have a disability or a special health care need. Uh, within the school systems, we see approximately 13%. Obviously, this changes depending on area. Uh, different states uh, have different reporting pieces. But we also have about 6% of all youth have emotional, developmental, or behavioral uh, conditions. And so one of the things for youth among in-community recreation programs that we're finding is that we don't see a lot of uh, tracking. So we don't exactly know how many youth are participating in, uh, say, after-school programs or community programs, because oftentimes that's not something that is um, really tracked uh, per se on a membership form or an application of some sort. Typically and justly, those are voluntarily um, given. And oftentimes, they're given uh, after the fact of the membership form. So parents, uh, rightfully, in, in some cases, have a fear of refusal of services. And so even though it may be, does your child have a disability on the membership form, we're, we're not getting reporting of that. And that happens in, in many programs, um, after school programs, community programs uh, in general. And then we look at adults and we have 22% nationwide, uh, specifically in Oregon, 21.7% report uh, having a disability of some sort. All right. So a significant portion of our population, uh, one fifth you know, of, the, of the population is, is reporting having a disability. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of physical activity? When we look at the general population, we see that 42% of children get the recommended amounts of physical activity. It's really low, right? Um, 60 minutes a day uh, is not typically done, and we see it dramatically decreases in adolescence. Um, especially among females, okay? Uh, so up to 8% in adolescents, and then even further decrease in adulthood. So we have less than 5% of the adult population meeting the recommended guidelines of um, 150 minutes a week of moderate physical activity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous physical activity, uh, along with bone strengthening, muscle strengthening, and aerobic activity. So we, we've got some challenges here. Uh, one of the things that we see most is as age increases, physical activity decreases, OK? Uh, dramatic decrease in adolescence. And then in general, even within adults, we see that males are typically more active than females. So this is within the general population. So what does this look like for individuals with disabilities? Okay. We see similar age trends um, than typically developing peers. We've seen some research done in different areas, which one of the challenges we see within looking at physical activity um, for individuals with disabilities is we can't say that all people with disabilities are the same. 
So we have a tendency to look at intellectual disabilities versus autism versus physical disabilities and breaking it up to find some barriers and facilitators that way. Uh, we've got a couple studies. So we see 47% of youth with autism spectrum disorder okay, um, met guidelines, but we saw them in shorter bouts. So the typical bout that we'd like to see is 10 minutes as a bout of physical activity. Uh, for this study, they found that they accumulated 60 minutes, like the recommended guidelines were, but they were in bouts of two to three minutes. Okay. So kind of goes back to we're seeing, I mean, 47%, that's above average, right, of the general population. So that's a good thing. Uh, and then for intellectual disabilities, we have a lot of, a lot of challenges of figuring out, not just from measuring and self-reporting, um, but we don't have a ton of information on how individuals with intellectual disabilities meet the guidelines. Um, for adults with disabilities, it's very similar to uh, adults without disabilities. But on the health side of things, we see that individuals with disabilities as adults have higher rates of smoking, alcohol use, and what we would consider risky health behaviors. So uh, on the physical activity side, very similar, but we see kind of these, these risk behaviors um, on the health side. And we see that leisure time physical activity, 50%, 56% get no physical act, leisure time physical activity, whereas in the general population, we have only 36% of adults not getting any leisure time physical activity. So almost, almost double, all right? So some of the barriers, so what are the potential things that can help facilitate physical activity or uh, be a barrier to participation in physical activity. There's one study that really, um, really does a great job of identifying uh, these barriers and facilitators, and many of them are echoed in different studies that have looked at specific areas within this. Um, James Rimmer is uh, out of the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and has done a lot of work in uh, public health and looking at um, populations of individuals with disabilities and health behaviors and physical activity. Uh, this is one of his studies where they did focus groups, numerous focus groups in seven different regions across the US. And they found that within the focus group, so they had city planners, they had recreation, and fitness professionals. They had individuals with disabilities and they had architects. We're all these different groups. And so they did these focus groups looking at the barriers from different perspectives. And these are the major themes that they came up with. So we're looking at the built and natural environment. Some of the built environment barriers were not enough sidewalks um, or not well kept sidewalks. Uh, some of the other pieces were ramps were at too high of an angle. Um, some of the natural environment pieces were even just grass being not cut low enough. Um, different pieces within those environments. Some of the facilitators were kind of in some ways the opposites, but um, having accessible signs visible right, in the, in the built environment. Uh, when we look at cost, uh, one of the things that was interesting is for fitness facilities that were not accessible, members with a disability were still expected to pay the same membership, but they couldn't utilize some of the services. So it was looking at, you know, should we really have to pay the full membership if we can't actually access all of the services that you have? Also looking at uh, if they have an aid that comes with them, well, that aid isn't working out. That aid is being um, a part of facilitating the, their participation. So why does the aid need to have a membership in that gym as well? All right. Equipment. Uh, some of the barriers were not enough room between equipments. 
um, not having adapted equipment. So uh, not having equipment that for somebody that uses a wheelchair that they always had to transfer out to get on the weight bench or um, to get on to different uh, equipment rather than having the where they can pull in, lock their brakes and, and use the equipment. Uh, some of the facilitators within that equipment were uh, having straps that uh, in Velcro that could help uh, individuals hold on to equipment better with they had a, a weaker grip, right? Guidelines, codes, regulations, and laws. Um, it seemed across the board within this, especially the laws piece of it, that ADA obviously isn't perfect, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and that compliance isn't monitored, right? So for the individuals with disabilities, their, um, what they brought up as barriers was that it wasn't necessarily monitored and that it really came down to them um, threatening in some ways or, or pushing towards legal action for anything to be done. Uh, information is... Some of the, the barriers were not knowing what is available in the community. So this is a big piece. Not knowing what was accessible, what wasn't accessible. Uh, some of this came to knowledge and education, but looking at uh, staff and did they know what the policies were? Did they know what the procedures were? Um, could they get the information to individuals? So some of the facilitators were having the information in different formats, having it in different locations, right? Uh, the next three are, are the areas that I've looked at uh, in some of my research, and we'll see some of that in a little bit, but knowledge, education, and training. Okay. One, of, um, one of the largest barriers that we see is lack of knowledge. Uh, and, and this is lack of knowledge in, in a lot of different ways. One is a lack of knowledge for in this study for fitness staff and professionals, understanding what disabilities are, um, but also understanding how to adapt different things. And I see this, I work a lot with after school programs, and this is one of the largest barriers that we see is we have staff that they want to help, but don't know how, and are afraid to offend or don't know exactly what's the appropriate thing to do. So knowledge becomes a, a kind of a big piece of it. That goes with education and with training. Um, one of the challenges that was identified was that training costs money. We know that, right? So one of the barriers was uh, programs not, not putting a value on the training and uh, not identifying that education was an important piece. Okay, uh, There were some comments of for the fitness facilities that all it was was the bottom line that the owners were concerned about. And it wasn't you know, creating a community-oriented piece where everybody had access. It was, well, we just we care about the bottom line. So that was acted as one barrier. Some of the areas that became facilitators was involving the individuals with disabilities and asking for their feedback on what would make this more accessible or how can we help you or um, what could we provide that would be helpful to your experience. Okay. Um, another piece was the, well, that was policies and procedures. We'll get to that. So perceptions and attitudes. Um, we see some of this too is um, perceptions of inclusion are, uh, we have to do it rather than this is a positive thing to do because it allows for um, participation across you know, a diverse population. Uh, so some of that was perceptions there, but also perceptions of disability. And some people have negative perceptions towards disability, whether that's based on their experience or based on their lack of experience working with individuals with disabilities. And so those perceptions become um, an important piece. And, and I'll talk about that uh, in the study that I did a little bit later. And then policies and procedures. Uh, some of the individuals with disabilities uh, had identified that the having policies towards um, perhaps a come and try 
to see if this facility works for you, is accessible for you. Having that before they have to pay the, the annual membership would be really helpful because if the, the facility isn't accessible, then why, why does that individual want to be um, using that, uh, that recreation or that um, fitness facility? And some of the other uh, groups had identified that communities uh, organizations don't have policies on um, what what is done, and the go-to typically becomes, well, we can't do that. It's not safe. That's kind of an across-the-board. Uh, we're worried about liability, and that when we don't have that knowledge or education, that seems to be the go-to kind of policy, and not really understanding that the liability is in many ways, the denial of access versus what is potentially risky um, safety-wise within their program. Okay. And then they had resource availability, which went a bit with cost uh, and the resources available to individuals with disabilities um, depending on their income. And so one of the things that they had for that that might be a facilitator would be a sliding scale. Um, and then emotional and psychological was really the, the environment and how it made individuals feel coming in um, on all ends. Okay. So if an individual with a disability stated that sometimes they don't feel um, comfortable because they feel like they're being judged or that they're being watched or that um, they're not really wanted in that facility, then that is a deterrent to their participation in physical activity. Whereas um, going into a facility or a building where um, ramps are accessible, the building is accessible, the built environment can actually create that, um, that welcoming piece as well. Okay. Any questions on, on any of this? Okay. So, with the kind of perceptions, um, attitudes, uh, my research looking at after school programs really identified that the staff are the key piece uh, for the outcomes related to after school programs. Uh, we see in after school programs that there is potential for physical activity uh, accumulation. Uh, it's actually the second highest reported uh, offering in after school programs is physical activity opportunities. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of research that looks at social emotional components, um, motivation, uh, peer acceptance, all different kind of constructs that can attribute to uh, experiences in after school programs. And staff have been a big part of that. Uh, so my focus was on staff, maybe going. There we go. So I use the theory of planned behavior, which um, Isaac Eisen developed, uh, looking at what contributes to actual behaviors. And so in his theory, he postulates that attitudes, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control all have a direct relationship to somebody's intention to perform a specific behavior. And that that intention is what contributes to performing the behavior. So the behavior in this, um, in this model was the inclusion of youth with disabilities in after school programs, right, by staff. So this is all staff are reported. So looking at this, this was just done through, uh, through a survey, anonymous survey. Um, I did some model fit to see if this was appropriate for, uh, this model was appropriate for the population. And we actually got some decent, some decent results. So we determined that the model or the theory does fit the population. So it's appropriate for use within the population. Uh, this theory has been used extensively in adapted physical education and physical ed education setting. Uh, so it was interesting to look at it from an after school program or a community setting perspective uh, and see how those per 
those compare because uh, we've seen it used with teachers um, in the physical education and, and adapted physical education setting. So attitude and subjective norms. So attitude is the perceived benefits or consequences of the behavior. All right. Subjective norms is the uh, pressures or expectations towards the perceived the behavior. And then what we got from that was that 53% of intention can be accounted for by the three constructs, perceived behavioral control, subjective norms, and attitude. And that 7.5% of behavior can be accounted for by intention. So not too bad. Uh, we would have liked to have had a larger sample size, but I think this is a really big um, starting point to understand because in the, in the teacher research, attitude is typically the largest contributor. Subjective norms coming in second. But within my research, subjective norms was actually the largest contributor to intention. And so when we look at subjective norms, we know that expectations of colleagues, of family, of coworkers, um, of organizations really play a large role in the intent to include the behavior. And I think this is a unique opportunity for community programs and after school programs to kind of understand and facilitate. Because when we look at many, um, many programs within communities, each one of them has a tendency to have their own mission, right? So if we have a mission-driven program or a mission-driven organization, if inclusion is a part of that mission, it becomes really easy to identify the expectations that, that are set forth, all right? So kind of an, an, opportunity, um, an opportunity there. So going back to our barriers and facilitators, right, it goes back to knowledge, okay? Knowledge, education, and training, community programs can provide that and identify within the culture of the program that this is what we expect. By providing trainings, typically when you provide a training, you're doing it for a reason because the administration or the, the organization values it. So um, we can add there perceptions and attitudes. By dispelling some myths about disability or um, by exposing individuals to individuals with disabilities or just the topic itself, uh, being able to ask questions, being able to gain knowledge on it can actually help change those perceptions and attitudes. And then when we look at policies and procedures, organizations can actually develop policies or procedures that make it explicit that no, inclusion is not just something we assume is being done, but it is a deliberate piece of our, of our programming. Wow, I'm going fast. All right, so some strategies and resources. So from an organizational standpoint, some of the, the things that can be done is one, educating administration, right? Understanding uh, that when we're looking at financial contribution, typically administration has to be on board or the board has to be um, has to have some buy-in to be able to understand that this is a value-add situation. So educating an administration, some of that may come down to identifying, look, we have this many individuals with disabilities in our programs. This is what can be added based on being able to include, um, include individuals more. Have an inclusion policy. Sometimes... The inclusion policy is a good place to start because sometimes we need something to be very explicit and deliberate to get it in as part of the overall culture of a program or an organization. So starting there may allow for it to, the inclusion piece to get in the door and then develop on its own. Okay. Organizations can convey their mission. Okay. Identify that inclusion is a, is a piece of that. Uh, some organizations have gone with 
inclusion is a big piece of it and a focus primarily on um, ethnic and racial inclusion, all right? And understanding that while inclusion is um, a very large term, that youth with disabilities need to be a part of that or adults with disabilities need to be a part of that um, inclusion piece. Okay. Another piece is obviously invest in staff training. And one of the big things is don't assume that it's automatically happening just because you have good people, right? Good people, good workers, um, while they may do their job great and may do things wonderful and interact with individuals great, it doesn't mean they have the knowledge or the skill base to really promote inclusion of individuals with disabilities. So um, I think this is one thing that we have a tendency to overlook. Oh, my staff is wonderful, right? But are they knowledgeable? Do they have the skill set to actually um, make something happen? And then from in, an individual standpoint, because while we would love for organizations to jump on board, make everything happen, we can't always wait for that. And when you're at the tire meets the road point and you're working with youth um, or adults that have disabilities, sometimes it takes us being responsible and saying, I need to figure something out that works for me. So some of the things you can do is Educate yourselves, and I have some, some little resources on that. Utilize the resources that are available. So many communities um, have resources that are available, and so finding out within the community what resources are available. And then talk with administration and express your need. It's one of the pieces is, you know, we can't always wait for administration to say this is a need. Sometimes it has to come from the bottom up and say, look, our program is suffering or you know, our, our individuals that are participating in our programs are not getting as much out of it because we need these things, okay? So being vocal or encouraging people to be vocal about uh, their needs can be very helpful. So these are some of the resources um, that I put together. Some of them, especially these two, I, I really like and they're just just to start, they're by no means an exhaustive piece of, um, of the resources that are available. But uh, NICPAD is, and, and I'm just going to go to some of these so you can actually see what they, what they look like. So NICPAD's focus is health and physical activity. So when, they, uh, when they're discussing health, they really are looking at not just healthy eating, um, but they're looking at physical activity as well. So what's great about NICPAD is they have this little piece here for different, uh, different types of professionals, right? So you can go to the educators piece and they've got great, um, great videos that, you know, are just kind of intro pieces. Uh, some resource, resources that are, are available. So um, sitting volleyball, so different physical activity pieces, um, discovering leisure, right? So different resources that are available to, that are specific to that kind of grouping of professionals. I mean, you can see here on the side too, coaching communication with deaf athletes. So really just kind of a, a plethora of resources. Right? Healthcare professionals. Okay. Again, there's just different articles that can be available. Did I miss this? Where's that? Where's that? This is um, the Community Health Inclusion Index is brand new. Uh, it's just been released. Uh, it's done through Nick Bad. And I'm actually gonna, there's a there's a video on it. And I'm just going to, it's about three minutes. I'm just going to have you watch it because I think this is going to be a great tool for communities or organizations or even just, as they explain here, just one company to really assess 
their inclusion, um, both physically and programmatically. So um, it'll explain a little bit more. You don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Basically, it's a tool. And if your aim is to improve your community so that it's healthier and more inclusive to people with disabilities, then you're probably going to want this tool. But it's not like a hammer, or a drill, or even a saw. The tool, you know, let's call it a tool bag. Inside your tool bag, you will find a level, a pressure gauge, a printed version of the chi, or you can download the Qi onto your smartphone. The Qi is just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yes, what I was going to say, the Qi is just one step in an easy to follow four step process. The Qi is a tool used to assess possible inclusion gaps and the information gathered from the Qi will help to bridge those gaps. Let's check out the diagram that'll explain the entire process. Now, keep in mind that this building could just as easily be a school, a park, a restaurant, or Susie's Corner Store. After you establish what needs to be assessed, like Susie's Corner Store, step one, assess the building using the chi. A B minus. The chi did not actually give out grades after assessment. The chi will point out accessibility issues and provide the user with solutions. And now, back to the program. Step two, the gathered information is analyzed. From that, a plan is hatched and, oh, I'm sorry. I think this is the wrong planning session. That was embarrassing. Where was I? Oh, yeah. After the data has been analyzed, the planning phase begins. Now, here comes the most exciting part of all. Step three. Implementation! Not all plans will require you to wear a hard hat, but that shouldn't stop you. And when you're done implementing, it's time for step four, the evaluation. So, I bet you're asking yourself, what can be chi? Well, we broke that down into three sections, macro, organizational, and on-site assessment. So, macro, think streets and sidewalks, public transportation, and coalitions. Organizational refers to stuff like policy, disability awareness training, and programs. On-site assesses whether a building is fully accessible inside, outside, and all around. On-site also looks at the availability of healthy foods and the access to physical activity. Okay, time for the feel-good ending. That's definitely not what I meant. So, you've completed the process identified what needs an assessment, assessed it, planned, implemented the plan, and you received a great evaluation. Awesome. Take a little time to be proud of the fact that Susie's store is now healthier and a lot more accessible to people with disabilities. Soak it all in, but not for too long, because your city still needs you. Look there, the cheese signal. Somewhere in this city, the chi is needed. But take the elevator, because the gift of flight, it's not in the chi tool bag. So just a simple uh, video explaining kind of what the chi uh, process is. And what's, what's nice about it is Oftentimes when we look at organization and, and evaluation, it becomes, oh, well, we need to spend a lot of money to have somebody come in and do that. The goal of the CHI is to be able to do it within your organization, within the program. It even offers some very specific um, solutions to some of the challenges there, uh, and there's, there's support available for that. So new tool uh, for our, an organizational kind of piece. Um, commit to conclusion is similar, looking at policy guidelines uh, to help with inclusion. The Inclusion Club is actually one of my favorite resources. I use it for my class all the time. I think it's a great, great tool um, for use with staff 
uh, with kind of individuals that are just kind of beginning out and understanding um, what, abil what disability is, um, how do we adapt things for individuals with disabilities. Uh, it's actually run out of the UK uh, and they have a ton of really great pieces. So their episodes are are typically on a, a specific topic. Uh, some of them revolve around uh, basic physical activity and how to adapt or modify the environment or the actual activities. Um, some of them get more on um, specific topics as far as social topics. Uh, two of my favorites are the tree frameworks, and they're actually in the other the other tips. Uh, but you can see here looking at uh, Paralympic athletes. So again, this is primarily focused on physical education uh, and physical activity. So those are the episodes, um, resources. The TED Talks are wonderful. Uh, I mean, most people are familiar with TED Talks. Uh, they've pulled ones that are, are very specific uh, to individuals with disabilities. So uh, the Amy Mullins one is actually, uh, is really great. Maysoon Zaid I show in class, um, she's a comedian uh, that has cerebral palsy. Uh, and so that's a, it's a really funny uh, video. Uh, Stella uh, talks about basically the objectification of disability and, and looking at things um, in this, kind of different perspective of, of in, inspiration for doing um, just normal um, kind of day-to-day -day, uh, things. And so the TED Talks, and they add to them periodically uh, when something new comes out, but those are, those are kind of my favorites uh, that I like to show. And then we have these videos. So the videos, you can see they're all, they're kind of themed. So looking at models of good practice, so showing examples of teaching techniques that work um, for specific uh, areas. Um, you can see they're kind of labeled, okay, community inclusion. Um, we've got a couple ads in there. Uh, two of my absolute favorites are the tree framework and the advanced tree framework. I think these are great tools for um, individuals who are just kind of starting out, it talks about teaching, rules, equipment, and environment, and how to modify those based on the individual's needs. So the tree framework talks about adapting and modifying um, for individuals with primarily physical disabilities where they come in with different um, needs, which is primarily equipment, versus the advanced tree uh, where individuals with intellectual disabilities have different needs from a adaptation and modification standpoint. And so they're really easy to understand. Um, it does get a little bit into um, constructivist versus instructivist um, learning theory, but very briefly. And so these are really great uh, kind of, I think both of those, each of them is maybe 15 minutes. Um, really great videos to just kind of get things started, even just starting a discussion on um, inclusion. So those are, oh, no, we don't want that. Those are some of the resources. This PBS, um, PBS actually has some really great, again, basic kind of practical stuff. Uh, for individuals and, and that are working with individuals with disabilities. I really like this misunderstood minds piece, uh, primarily because I actually have it as an assignment in my adapted physical activity class, because I think when we, we look at learning disabilities in an ADD, ADHD, we have these very big misconceptions of, of what is really going on. Uh, and so what I like about this is it breaks down the, um, the challenges into four areas. And then within each of those areas, we have kind of the basics about it, the difficulties, and 
there's experiences. So for my students, I have them, they have to participate in two of those activities, those experience pieces so that they can get an idea. It's kind of a, a simulation, if you will. And then we debrief that um, in class. So just kind of some interesting tools to, to kind of help educate and, and change some of those um, attitudes or perceptions about disabilities, um, and especially those that have large stereotypes associated with them.